people, friends that have been tested, that it took 10 days. So some of it is a delayed reaction. Yep. But this is all since the reopening um, that's causing this. It's not. Oh, that in other early open states too, or is Florida sort of unique? No, it's it, Texas, uh, um, Arizona, Arizona. All of us that opened early, Georgia seems to be not as bad as us, which is kind of interesting. But it may it, there's talk that sometimes people keep the numbers, you know, close to vest and whatever. So yeah, I don't know. I, I really couldn't, you know, of course, answer to any of that. But but there's but we're not yeah. seeing signs that it's gonna slow the reopening or that things are gonna lock down again. Right. It seems like that's sort of a, a one way street. Well, we have here. This is interesting. So a lot of uh, bars, especially, um, have ch they've chosen to close themselves. Collectively. Some yeah. Restaurants, yeah. Some restaurants have, too. I think the restaurants it may make sense because, you know, once they open, if they didn't get a big you know, response to customers, well, now you've got a full staff on. You're spending yeah. a lot of money. And it's like, uh, is it worth doing it when you were making money on takeout and curbside? So, I, I, again, this is all just, that's an opinion of one. First of all, thanks everyone for, uh, for being on this. And uh, we appreciate, again, all the sponsors and members. And Jack, thank you for being a big part of this as well. But a special thanks to, uh, you know, to, uh, to Quinn and, uh, and Farley and Rick. So Rick is a, appropriately Jennifer today, by the way. Um, but anyway, so <laughs> titles are Jack Lee, as you know, Haiku Master for D Data Central. Uh, Quinn Atkins is Director of Menu Development for Culver's Franchise Systems. Um, Farley is the uh, Culinary Innovation Manager for Wawa. And Rick is the Vice President of Sales and Marketing for Sweet Street Desserts. So I don't want to take much time here. Why don't we just get kicked off here with a, you know, I, we started yesterday with you, Quinn. Why don't we start with you again and just, you know, tell us kind of like from the a little quick snapshot from the beginning, but more so what's happening right now and, and where you see us going in the future. So, um, you know, as we, we talked about yesterday, we've been really, really fortunate in how our system has responded to the pandemic and, you know, we're 99% franchised and kind of the, the entrepreneurial spirit that our franchisees have exhibited in, you know, finding creative ways to drastically increase the drive-through uh, throughput because of all of our 750 restaurants, you know, every single restaurant only has a single drive-through lane. So, you know, we very quickly shut down the dining rooms as did, you know, everyone else. But the, uh, the crazy thing is we are, obviously we took a big hit in, um, March and, and early April, but by the, the fourth week in April, we were back to positive comps and we have, uh, yeah, it, it's just been extraordinary to see how our system has come together to really support our local communities as well as support the, the team members. Um, here at Culver Franchising, you know, we very, very lucky. We did not uh, furlough anyone. We didn't lay anyone off. And, you know, we've just been supporting the restaurants as best we can. You know, looking to the future, we are um, obviously cautiously optimistic, but, you know, we're not really uh, rolling out any crazy changes or a lot of innovation at this point simply because we're just kind of in that wait and see holding pattern and obviously our first mandate is to do no harm to the system does it look now as though business has sort of like found its new level or are you still seeing you know big changes from period to period no no we're pretty uh we're pretty consistent in terms of the the, the numbers that the, the the restaurants are putting up What's very interesting is, so we're consistently, you know, eight to 12% positive comps wow. year over year, but our experiences are down, I would say also in that 12 to 14%, which we're not terribly concerned about, even though we put a lot of stock in our experiences numbers, because that's the, really the best way to measure, you know, more butts and seats. But we know that, you know, one car may be ordering for five or six people ordering for an entire family. So we recognize that, you know, there's not really 
any good way to glean the the actual number of people that we're serving. So, but we're just fortunate that you know we're we're positive at all. Would that mean that average check is up maybe twenty five percent? Yeah, so? yeah, the average checks are pretty crazy. Pretty yeah, crazy. Are, actually, this is a question for for everyone. Are you are are you getting are people tipping all of a sudden in scenarios that they wouldn't normally tip? Are they not, not, yeah, not for our system. We, we actually have a policy that we don't, um, we don't allow that. Uh, I know there have been, you know, some social media instances yeah. where there have been some, but for the most part, the, the franchisees try to discourage that. It'd be interesting, Farley, for you to say, have people, you know, in, in Wawa come in to say, hey, thanks for being here and throw them an extra dollar or anything? Is, have you heard any of that? Or? Yeah, there's, um, like Quinn, to his point as well, there's not really an opportunity for that transaction to take place in our stores um, because of the pretty strict social distancing um, that we put into place and really the panel barriers that we put in place. There was probably even more of a reason not to come into contact in that way, just in, in that touch um, procedure. I would, I would say, though, that um, there was more of a reason for people to want to just make more eye contact or even try to, behind the mask, wanting to make sure that people were recognizing, hey, I'm smiling right now, or I'm, I'm trying to, to have some sort of a positive impact. Um, that's what people really tried to say what our associates are saying is that they're recognizing customers are going out of their way to try to have that that positive energy because that's harder to do behind a mask so it's interesting to say that even in that in kind of a, a harder time like that that consumers are reaching out to try to even say that so that's fantastic and i'm thankful for that because this is not easy for anyone and um especially in a in a fast-paced environment when you're we're a convenience store and people are trying to get in and out as it is. And we're already asking them to stay a little further away from us. So. Yeah. Here's a question, I guess, for both Quinn and Farley and be a perfect segue into to Rick, which is, have you seen sort of sales mix or day part mix change? And then what are the implications for a category like dessert maybe as we um, trail off into that? Yeah, that's, uh, that's certainly something that we're paying close attention to and really especially at the very beginning of the pandemic, hands down, lunch was the, you know, 70, 80% of the business. And, and we had restaurants that were shutting down, um, you know, in the evening and, you know, in certain states it was mandated. But, it, you know, the definitely the shift away from the, uh, the dinners and sandwiches and chicken we actually did not see as big of a drop in dessert sales as mm. you would kind of naturally into it and, and i think that goes back to people really are just they're craving those comfort foods those items that you know make them feel good and kind of reminds them of you know a more normal time so we have actually we were running into some supply chain challenges with with our our custard custard mix, but fortunately, we were able to manage through that. So, so to be clear, Quinn, you're you're saying that your lunch business, relative to everything else, actually increased and dinner went down, or no, no, it, it increased. Okay. So, typically, before before this all started, we were about sixty forty um, okay. in terms of lunch and dinner, and that's probably shifted it's starting to come back now as more restaurants are opening up but during the pandemic we were almost at you know 80 20 85 15 in lunch, lunch dinner you're saying lunch lunch to dinner oh that is so interesting because across uh food service um the trend was actually in the opposite direction of, of what of what you saw which is fascinating that historically lunch has always been the biggest day part but we saw dinner sort of overtake it um in the midst of the pandemic. So that's, and I, guess and I would say one of our struggles has been um, our, our morning day part, our breakfast day part and our coffee is down and that's a struggle for us. And inherently then that takes a, a hit to our, our breakfast sandwich and also our bakery case. So a lot of those things go hand in hand and that builds our basket. Um, even the things that we put in place, Still to keep in place with being 
as safe as we can in the retail space by flow wrapping, individually flow wrapping every single one of our, um, our bakery pieces, uh, making sure that nothing is hand touched by anyone um, that comes and receives to us. Um, those measures and those specific things that we've done to make sure that we're safe. People just are not going, they're not stopping on their way to work if they're going to work because so many people just have not made it back into work quite yet in our areas. So that morning day part is where we've taken the hit the most. Have you seen, uh, I guess, how quickly does breakfast scale back up for you as certain states reopen? Is there a pretty long delay or is there an immediate correlation? We hope that it will scale up pretty quickly. Um, I mean, it is one of our highest volume times. It always has been. We have such a high volume for our breakfast sandwich and our coffee business. It's our core, two of our core brands at Wawa. And so it's a concern for us. I would say, you know, as soon as COVID hit, it was an immediate impact for us. We hit, we saw really, really strong numbers drop in that, um, which was a concern. I would say though, um, thankfully, Wawa is, um, you know, the position that we've taken, we've been able to really put, it, put ourselves in a position to protect ourselves and, and be able to protect our employees and the position of the company to sustain ourselves, which is, I'm thankful for that. Um, but again, there's just so much about this that we don't know still at this point. We don't know what the impact of this throughout the rest of the year is going to be. So we're trying to get as, um, I guess, try to put ourselves in the place of trying to understand what this could look like throughout the rest of the year and get it as preemptive as possible to what this could look like, both on every extreme. If it's, if this is as bad as it's going to get, how do we build from that? And if it gets worse, how do we prepare for that as well? So uh, we hope that we can drive volume, but we also hope that, you know, if it, if it doesn't come back, then what type of promotional opportunities can we put into place to you know, make sure that our consumers understand the safety position that we're taking in our stores as well. And Harley, and where you are too, your stronghold is really Northeast, Mid-Atlantic. I know you're in Florida here as well, but um, I would assume that with people, you, you're not, a lot of those markets are not going back or they're just starting to go back. So yeah. I can certainly see where that breakfast would get hurt bad because, you know, the traffic was down here until we opened up. Then traffic on the road started to pick up. Cars are out. People are going back to work. So you're probably going to see a lot of that in the coming weeks as the, because Boston's opening up again too, right? So Massachusetts, Mid-Atlantic, where you guys are, I'm, you're going to probably see a lot more. We just haven't seen it yet. I mean, the population density out here is so much different than in a lot of other areas. And so we, I feel like it's been the slow trickle of, yeah. of what we're, finally starting to understand and um, we are sitting our a lot of our stores we're making decisions because of how densely populated we are in those cities too so florida has been a good understanding for us to since we did open up a lot more in florida but we closed down our bto salad um, just specifically because of spoilage we also, you know, took out, um, we did skew rationalization because of spoilage and we're going to start to just understand how to reintroduce those things back into our system and find out what makes sense for the future of Wawa. Uh, Rick, uh, you want to talk a little bit about desserts and how maybe people are changing what they're getting from food service and the role the dessert plays? Yeah, well, as, as the restaurants start opening up, the ones that were open, uh, or reporting to us that uh, the dessert sales were actually climbing. Yep. Um, and that and, you know, a lot of the operators were really going to more of a limited menu, but everybody's keeping dessert on the menu. And you know, albeit not as many desserts as they used to have, uh, we're hoping to get back to that. But the ones that they do have on the menu seem to be really working out well. You know, people want to, you know, enjoy themselves. You know, they, they want to stay in the restaurant longer. Um, and, uh, instead of just sitting there drinking a cup of coffee, you know, they'll still tend to order that dessert. So, uh, yeah. So, you know, from Sweet Street's perspective, uh, we did a lot of volume with uh, the hotel segment yeah. and I really need that to come back for us to, <clears throat> you know, to st stay successful. Um, but we're also seeing a big rise in our, uh, individually wrapped items. Um, because, you know, basically that new touch point, 
And, you know, that seems to be a, a really big winner for us right now. As a matter of fact, we're way ahead of where we were last year, despite all this. What do you think of, um, you think it's an opportunity to sell like, uh, you know, via the restaurant, like a whole cheesecake or something to the consumer to bring home? We absolutely saw some of that, uh, especially, you know, from the curbside. Yeah. The takeout. Yeah, they, they, absolutely. They were selling, you know, whole cakes, uh, you know, whole trays of bars, basically like a family style. Uh, because you know, when they're picking it, pe- picking up the products, um, you know they you know they take a whole cake home with them, which is pretty cool. Yeah, I think like special occasion stuff for birthdays and whatnot. Were they doing that for that? I you know I would assume it's really just for the meal, uh, you know the the, the family meals. Uh, but I, I'm certain that you know they would probably do it for any celebrations if anybody's celebrating anything out there. So. Yeah, I, I will say prior to COVID, if you know, oftentimes my refrigerator is not that full. I'm like, yeah, that's no big deal. Now it's like it's really awesome to have a full fridge with just lots of goodies in there. So I can see <laughs> someone just want to load their place up with some great desserts at the same time. You mentioned, I think yesterday, Rick, that like the flavors and varieties and, and, and products have changed a little bit that customers are buying and selling. Can you talk about that? And is there any rhyme or reason to that madness or does it seem random? Uh, no, there's, we can definitely see it. Yeah, we did see a mix in the shift of our products, uh, but it's mostly because we sold uh, a lot of, uh, you know, grab and go items, uh, you know, basically for, you know, the hotel segment. And, you know, that basically just, you know, that's not even close to being back yet. Yeah. So, but we're having a lot of people come to us and say, hey, I, I need a different solution now. You know, like I said, the individually wrapped product or, uh, I need something that is going to be very easy for our, for uh, our employees and our wait staff to plate. Um, you know, nothing too elaborate because uh, you know, again, they're, yeah. they're short staffed and they want to make sure that you know we can provide them with something easy to serve. So, hey, Rick, what do you hear about college and university now? Because they just announced um, just yesterday, really, about Florida reopening universities here of course, strict guidelines and things that they can do. But are you hearing much rumble around the country about them opening again in the fall and you getting back to business there? Well, it's going to be different. You know, there's in each one of the colleges, especially here in Pennsylvania, the ones I'm paying attention to, um, they seem to be shifting as far as, you know, they're not going to be opening the dining halls completely. Um, you know, they're going to be more smaller revenues. Most of them aren't even opening up all the restaurants. So there's just a few that they're opening up. So, uh, and there's a lot of restrictions on it. So, so I think it's going to be different, uh, but um, definitely uh, it's, you know, it, you know, sat on a couple uh, webinars on there. And basically it's really going to be a, a, by a, you know, but, you know, by a college by college decision as far as what they're going to do. Yeah. That'll be interesting. You know, what's funny you said about, you know, more about Pennsylvania schools because you're home. We can all relate to this because we all traveled so much. I've never learned so much about the city I live in. <laughs> <laughs> so true. That's funny. No. Zach, you got something? No, I actually I'd like to maybe go back to, to, to Quinn for a moment and we could shift the focus to just menu and menu changes and, um, and what your menu looks like today. Uh, what do you think it's going to look like six months from now? It's going to be as big, half the size. Uh, are there long-term implications too? Yeah, uh, so obviously, you know, we had the same, um, not as uh, – I would say not as deep as some brands were having supply chain challenges, but you know we certainly have had our our challenges over the last three months. And right now there are two of our menu items that are not being offered because we just couldn't get the products. The jury is still out as to whether or not they will come back. And I think you know as with many others, we are certainly looking at this slightly as an opportunity to potentially pare down some of the, you know, less, less popular offerings. Um, but we're also, and we always have been very cautious about doing that simply because we recognize this is kind of a fraught time and we 
we don't want to alienate um, you know any of our guests and, and want to kind of maintain that that visceral and emotional connection that they have with our brand but uh, you know we would be um, we would certainly be kind of shirking our, our responsibilities if we weren't looking at things with a far more critical eye than potentially we have in the past. I, I don't believe that you're going to see anything massive, any kind of a seismic shift. Yep. And that's simply because the breadth and depth of our menu has always been kind of one of our points of differentiation and, and a competitive advantage from, from our perspective. So um, I think probably the biggest impact is the, the suspension and kind of the halt of all, you know, menu testing and, uh, you know, strong innovation pushes that we had going, you know, coming out of the first quarter has certainly basically been ground to a halt. And we had our first uh, strategic menu planning meeting yesterday, and that does not look like that's really going to change much coming into the latter half of the year. Do you think that's more a function of just being able to get together and do stuff? Or is it, hey, we're not sure where the economy is going to be, so let's you know, pump the brakes a little bit? Actually, I think it's more of we don't want to introduce any unnecessary complexity to our system and, and, and for the restaurants where we want to streamline as much as possible because you know we only have about 60% of our system that have opened the dining rooms back up at this point. So there is still a sizable chunk of our restaurants that are, you know, just serving guests through that single drive-through lane. So, you know, speed of service obviously is you know, job one and adding anything that's gonna slow that down is just not not in the cards right now. And you talked about how you increased drive-through uh, throughput dramatically. What were the steps to get there? I'm just sort of curious, how do you actually do that? Yeah, uh, it's, it's actually a really, really fascinating process because we had started some pilot tests of technology with like tablets and, and we're talking very, very small numbers of restaurants. So we had a very loose grasp of what that would look like. But when this hit, the floodgates opened in terms of demand for, uh, you know, being able to facilitate multiple vehicles and you know uh, anticipatory cooking in, in on the back line and so we had to cobble together a system because our back office system is um, well antiquated would be being kind uh, it's probably being an insult to a lot of antiques out there but um, so finding a way to interface the newer generations and the newer technology platforms with our you know customized um you know stone age back office system was the biggest hurdle and we we kind of had to do a bolt-on so a lot of restaurants are using um kind of uh whole independent tablet packages that then display to a screen in the restaurant where then a team member will input it into the POS and then that that generates the tickets. Uh, fortunately, we do have speaker systems in our back of houses. So as the guests are placing their orders or the team member is repeating it into the microphone, our, our uh, cooks and our back of house teams are hearing that as they're being ordered and so they can go ahead and start start cranking. In the stores where you've allowed people to come in now, um, what does that traffic mix look like compared to what it was pre-COVID? Oh, it's it's still um, it's still a trickle and and many restaurants are just doing um, the takeout orders in the lobby and the dining rooms are not yet open okay. from the and, and it's primarily, as you would expect, in the states that have, you know, drastically loosened the restrictions. Arizona, I think, is the, the highest percentage of all of the restaurants in that state. I think we're at like 90% of the, the restaurants there that have fully reopened the dining room. Um, you know, we always had kind of that hybrid uh, fast casual service model. So guests would order at the counter, but then we would deliver the food to the tables, and then we have 
um, team members in the dining rooms doing table touches throughout the, the experience for the guests. So uh, we've kind of amplified that where, you know, we ask that the guests not get their own refills and, you know, we'll bring anything that, that they might need actually to them. It's just trying to minimize the congregating at the beverage station, being able to control that, uh, that disinfectant and that, that sanitizing process much more cleanly without, you know, um, the people factor from, yeah. from, from guests. So Farley, I mean, in a C-store environment, so much of it is self-service too, whether it's uh, and, and we know the consumers aren't feeling totally safe about that quite yet. What are you doing and, and what do you think needs to be done in general, I guess, too? So that's a super loaded question. And I feel like it changes every day. <laughs> and we have conversations about it. Literally every other day, there's a meeting that happens. And I think it's just to keep up with everything as it changes. I think we say often, there's so much about this environment that we don't know. And we're learning all the time. Um, as we see numbers spike, and we see different states doing things, and we're learning differently. Um, but what we have done is we've tried to isolate the places that we think could be the most potential at-risk places for our consumers and try to find out how we can make those places the the safest cleanest ways that um, they can access us and feel safe and comfortable with us so that's in our touch screen areas we have sanitized um, actual areas where people can access sanitizer access wipes they can clean and sanitize before use and after use all of those things we shut down our self-serve beverage area for a long time actually you could not actually self-serve your own beverage so in order to get coffee we um we had someone a coffee attendant that would pour your coffee for you and you would let them know how much cream or sugar you wanted in there so it, it really got to that point where you were having a lot of conversations with your consumers um, we were really serving our consumers in a different way which gave us a lot of access to have conversation but it did not it did not fit the pace of what our consumers needed from us either uh, but it was about safety. Since then, we've gotten to the point where we've opened back up to self-serve beverage, but we've put place, put things in place to, to make things um, safer to that extent. Um, it's really about the barriers of safety and how close, uh, how much access people have to their own safe space. It's about how, much, how many people are allowed in the store at a time. And we're taking a look at just how quickly things are made behind the line, evaluating that as well, which will, again, speed up the speed of service to help our um, consumers get in and out as quick as possible. But we're also just taking a look at packaging and making sure that we have the optimal packaging so that everything is tamper evident and, and the, anything that people pick up hasn't been able to be touched by um, any other consumer previously. So there's things like that that are in place that probably should have been done a long time ago, um, just from a responsibility point of view, um, that won't go away as any of this lifts and moves on. We'll, we'll keep in place, you know, to move on in the future. So actually, well, the barista oh. thing, that's really cool. But you know, you said that some of the build your own areas, I assume that salad and other things like that. Did you add new products that you knew would be popular or did you already have them in place prior to? Because I know you had a lot of that stuff anyway. So we had, we took away salad, like um, the BTO build your own salad from the screen. We just, we were losing in spoilage because of the decrease in traffic. We've since then opened that back up because we've seen enough traffic to support the product. However, I would say that there were a lot of things that we did on the fly that we were able to um, build specific things and put them on the warmer. So if someone wanted soup, we, you could grab that from the warmer and go, things like that. We were able to, and to kind of put those things in place rather than lose the product. Um, we were letting people access it in a different way. Yeah, yeah. One thing, while we're on you, Farley, I mean, you said something I thought was so amazing that you know, you worked with one of your major competitors is Sheets. And I mm -hmm. love the story that you told about how the two companies got together to feed the community. I think that's just amazing. That, those are the things that come out of, you know, a, a crisis uh, that just give you that great, you know, warm feeling that, hey, we're great. We're a great country. And it's just awesome to see companies come together to help. So yeah. can you talk about that a little bit? Certainly. Um, I, I constantly am amazed just at the, how we keep going back to these big 
core values that we have as a company and I'm really proud of that. I've, I've seen a lot of things put in writing that you walk by on a wall and, and we never really talk about them, but in our company, it seems like that we always go back to that. And, um, you know, when COVID hit, there were many opportunities that probably could have happened where we could have really tried to make a bunch of profit on this. And it didn't go that way. It was really about how do we take care of our employees in these situations? How do we pay them appropriately while they are at risk at, of being in the front lines of our operations? Um, how do we provide them meals to take home to their families because their families have lost jobs in these situations? Um, it, it really was piling our arms around them to make sure that they were okay. Um, but another part of that was uh, really just partnering up with other industry professionals. And one of those was our competitor, Sheets, who was another convenience store in this area. And we did a partnership that we connected with them to feed the communities in the area. And we were able to gather product from manufacturers that had reached out and said, we've got all this product that we can't use or that we um, have manufactured that's going to spoil or that we had just supplied on our own um, because it was the right thing to do. And we went out and served quite a few different communities um, in partnership with Sheets. And we took our, our semi trucks out and just went into communities and fed communities that were um, struggling a bit. So it was nice to have uh, to take part in that and also just to be able to show that, yes, we there's this kind of Wawa versus Sheets war that talks they talk about all the time where we actually are in a pretty friendly relationship with them. But it's nice to be able to see those things come together when we're recognizing that though we might not all be in the same boat, but we're all in the same river in situations like this. So that's cool. And Rick, you said the same kind of thing, right? Where you guys were in a situation where, you know, your warehouses started to fill up and you wanted to donate product. Can you talk to that a little bit? Sure. Yeah. Well, you know, we kept producing, you know, despite the, everything went shut down because, you know, we have all those raw ingredients, so we you know, had to. Um, but we had a bunch of product that we were trying to donate uh, to the food banks and, uh, you know, pretty much not just in Pennsylvania or just not in our county, but, you know, we looked at Baltimore, New York, uh, all these different cities. We couldn't find anybody that would take the product because of the frozen desserts that you know, their freezer spaces were so full up from people donating food to the food bank, which makes total sense. But then our employees did something pretty cool. Where they uh, came by and uh, picked up uh, a bunch of desserts at, from the warehouse, loaded up in their cars and drove them over to the hospitals and nursing homes. And it was really cool just to you know get the stuff to the staff and um, and it, it wasn't driven by management team. It's just people just took it on their own to do it. So we were very proud of what they did. I'm just going to say none of those salted caramel Rice Krispie bars made it to my house. Right? <laughs> just I know somebody that, that can take care of that for you, Farley. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Kelly already knows. <laughs> Hey Rick, um, real quick, are, are you guys planning on expanding your um, individually wrapped desserts to kind of um, include some of your more popular sliced desserts? Is there any talk internally to kind of expanding that platform moving forward? Absolutely. Yeah, we're, uh, we're working on that right now, actually. Uh, we have, there's probably, I'd say about uh, 16 to 18 different items that we're in the process of working on. Um, one is, uh, you know, some just, you know, standard individually wrapped products. And then the other one is more of the desserts that you're talking about. So it's, you know, it's, it's a little bit of a magic trick to find the right packaging. Oh yeah. Um, but uh, we, we, we think we got it nailed and we're right now. The, our only problem is that we can't get the packaging fast enough. So I was in a meeting this morning where we, we finally Specked out and found a, a manufacturer that could do do what we wanted quickly, because it got to look good. You know, they, it got to look good in the packaging. That's and the, the packaging, as long as it's safe, tamper proof, is as important as the product. You know, so yeah, we we feel confident that we finally nailed it. I can tell you that if you ever decide to um, pre bake your cookies and package them, um, uh, I'll be first in line. Yeah. <laughs> well, we got that. 
Hey, so we do have the cooking thing. Wrap. It sounds like I got to send this whole panel a bunch of desserts. So <laughs> get rid of hey, uh, Rick Quinn talked earlier about, you know, product mix and things down the road. And, you know, I mean, I know you've got to be looking at, you have so many SKUs. I mean, how do you handle and maintain and figure out um, forecasting and where you're going and what, you know, what's, what's tomorrow, next month, next year look like? Well, that's a great question. As this, you know, mentioned that, you know, we, we have a ton of inventory right now, right? But obviously I don't have a ton of inventory of every single item. So we're still producing with a very short staff. But the, the critical thing for me and what's taken up all my time uh, and uh, you know, my team's done is that we got to get that forecasting right because you know, we can't be cutting any type of national accounts and or chains and people depend on us. So we want to make sure that we're doing the right thing. Some of the slower moving items, uh, I don't think they're going to make it through the COVID. You know, they're, they're going to, unfortunately, that's the, the disease that actually, you know, with, actually is contracted by uh, desserts, certain desserts. So, so they're, they're not going to last. No. Yeah. Um, but yeah, definitely. It's, you know, you know, getting that mix right is critical. Because I, I, when you said I'm running with a relatively, you know, small crew, and we want to make sure we're what we're making is what we absolutely need and what our customers need. So, is there a thought? I think this applies to everyone that the things that consumers are ordering today may not be reflective of what they'll be interested in a couple months from now. That we're still a little bit in that comfort food mindset, but perhaps that is not necessarily where we're always going to be. And, and how does that impact how you think about menu or the variety of dessert or um, anything else? I absolutely think that's true. I think right now, and I speak specifically from the Wawa standpoint, and we spoke about this yesterday, just Wawa is a very loyal consumer, specifically in the Mid-Atlantic region. When, they, when a consumer comes to Wawa, they want their hoagie that they've always been able to get their, you know, their comfort food really is what that is. And um, so, we have not stopped innovation in uh, what we're doing. I have a lot of um, partners that have been sending me samples to my home. Thank goodness I'm kind of set up for that. But um, I, I have, you know, I've got partners out there that are, you know, I've got Highland Bakery is, is doing a, a virtual immersion innovation with me. And we're, and we're going about innovation differently. We're just thinking about it differently. Um, I've got Tojo who's, sending me product and driving it over and I'm still getting into my kitchen to do innovation. I don't know if that's tomorrow or if it's, you know, two years from now, but it, it may not be the comfort food of, of today that people are buying, but we, we're not stopping what we think innovation from, a, a, you know, a year to a year and a half from now is going to look like, because I think people are going to want to step back out and do, um, they're going to want to experiment again and they're going to want to, to take chances again. And that's kind of the approach we're taking is we want our pipeline to be full and ready um, for when our consumers are. Yeah. yeah and I, I, I'd say that, you know, we've been fortunate over the last several years to really be aggressively um, maintaining and developing our pipeline because of the unique nature of our service model. And, you know, we've, as I, as I said earlier, we've certainly had to kind of grind that to a halt, but you know, our expectation from the innovation aspect is that we will just pick up where we left off. But I think one of the things that's been keeping me up at night is will there be a fundamental shift now that people understand that they can get through the drive-through, and we had already seen over the last five years a you know small but inexorable decline in the dine-in experiences. So the question now becomes, how do we make that innovation look at it even more acutely through the lens of portability and ease of eating outside of the restaurant? So. And that specifically comes in um, in the dessert category. So that's certainly something that I've started thinking about and will be exploring aggressively as we move forward. There's an interesting thing. I mean, 
with the drive through but more just cars in general that I think we've seen where the cars become sort of like a personal extension of our own personal bubbles in a way. And this is a bit more anecdotal, but it lines up with some of the research we've done where we're seeing like parking lot picnics and, and that type of thing. And I, I think what happens is if you see go to the drive through you're probably coming from somewhere and going home or in the opposite direction. Now people are just going out and leaving their house and just getting food. They're not coming from work or a movie or shopping. And as a result, they don't have a destination in mind of where they need it. It's not like they're going to the office and eat it there. They're not necessarily on their way home and eat it there. They're just pulling over in a parking lot, opening up the tailgaters, or just eating in their car or something. Have you thought more about not just you know people getting food at the drive through or taking it to go, but that the consumption is more likely to happen in the car these days. And, and how does that change how we think about food? It absolutely does. And that's kind of where the packaging comes in. And, and we had been working on that um, anecdotally and kind of at a low level. You know, everyone's, everyone in the industry is looking for that, you know, fry container that'll keep the fries hot and crispy. And, you know, we, we have a, you know, a pretty, large selection of fried items that, that, that come out of our restaurant. So that's certainly something we'll, we'll continue to um, press for innovation and, and, um, and evolution in the technology. But, you know, really what's on my mind is how to address the dessert. So we know that like our concrete mixers, those do great. Shakes, malts, that, those do great. But we've seen a decrease not, not crazy, but enough to kind of, you know, catch my attention in the Sundays, the specialty Sundays, and even, you know, just cups and cones because of that increase over the last, you know, five years from the uh, away from restaurant experiences. Um, so that's probably where most of my head's going to be at. Um, and, and also, you know, if we have four or five of our pub burger platform that you know we want to bring back i think if one is you know far messier or has more ingredients than some of these others then that's probably going to weigh against that particular concept from you know coming back in the immediate near future so that that facilitating the eating experience in the car to your point i think has to be a, an area of focus you know, I think, you know, just personal experience, if I'm eating in my car, maybe I have the item in one hand and I have the packet of ketchup or something or other. And what do you do? I like literally put that thing in my teeth and I just sort of rip it open. <laughs> I'm thinking like, maybe I'm worried about COVID. That's not probably not the smartest thing to do mm -hmm. where I'm putting someone else's hands basically inside my mouth as I'm doing that. Do we do more things where we offer to sauce up the items for the customer or give them more options to do that where maybe they're not having to handle um, the condiments as much, or, uh, you know, I, I don't know what else we do with that. So Heinz, Heinz has the, the dip and squeeze. Yep. Um, and, and that, that has been, you've seen a, and, and had been for, you know, uh, the past several years, a, a pretty serious shift to restaurants offering that as opposed to the, you know, the old foil packets. So I think that, that kind of helps a little bit there. Um, the crazy thing is, is that, you know, we're still serving, you know, 120,000 portions of our Wisconsin cheddar cheese sauce still every week. And that, uh, you know, people are, people are dipping, dipping in their cars, apparently. Yeah. Arla, you can talk to that because I'm sure everything coming out of Wawa is meant to be in a car, right? Yeah. You no, know, it's so funny. I was just having this conversation with Alan the other day as we were having, we were talking about what could bowls of the future, like noodle bowls and broth bowls of Wawa look like, right? And I'm like, that is not portable at all. But I should still be talking about it and thinking about it because we, it's a gap for our offer. And certainly I don't want to leave any stone uncovered. But you're right. There's that portability piece that how's anyone going to eat a noodle bowl? And or like a ramen bowl in their car. The shape of the bowl, right? I feel like a traditional sure. styrofoam cup noodles thing or whatever. Feels but I don't want to spill that all over myself in the car. Yeah. That's just not, I mean, a hoagie is one thing, but broth, no thank you. Yeah. However, I will say that, you know, there comes a point too, like 
certainly in this pandemic where we didn't eat. Now, my house is a little diff different. I'm, I'm married to a chef as well. So there's just a lot of cooking, a lot of just food in this house. But um, my kids think they're chefs. But this, in this area, we didn't really do a whole lot of eating out or take out a lot. We got to the point, though, where I would have done just about anything for some spicy noodles or dumplings or something that I didn't have to make. So we went downtown Philly and ordered them out, sat in our truck on the side of the road under a railroad track. And that was probably the most romantic date I've had in a year just to have those dumplings because I wanted something that wasn't in my house and I was in my vehicle. So to that point, you're absolutely right. It's, um, it's about how do we make it more accessible and, um, convenient and how our consumers can have that experience with us. And so I don't know, I, I look at that from the Wawa perspective and the portability part of it. And I think that how much of this is going to be people that are just going to wait to eat it at their desk or get to their destination and how many people really do need to eat it while they're driving on the road. And that's a lot of testing that has to be done on our side of things and a lot of consumer research we have to do. Yeah. You, Carla, you mentioned delivery too, and I thought that was yeah. really interesting that, you know, your concept, people were obviously in love with your food, you know, and they're like not willing to come into the store. So yeah. talk a little bit about what happened in delivery and, and how it amped up during this time. Yeah, so we ended up having a really huge decline in sales, obviously when people just weren't leaving their house and we recognized really quickly that we needed to be able to we already had a delivery model set up it, it wasn't it wasn't full system yet we needed to be able to get into people's homes we needed to be able to let them experience us but in a way that they felt comfortable and safe with we in lightning speed ramped up our delivery system and it was wasn't graceful and it's not pretty um, just in the way that the technology works or doesn't work um, to its best ability but even our mobile deliver our mobile apps um, the mobile system is is pretty incredible in that ordering system we hit a million orders in five months um, which may not be a big deal for some companies but for Wawa in just the this lo the location that we're at we're not nationwide um, and so that was a pretty big deal for us just in how quickly we had really ramped it up. So with mobile and delivery, it really just went to show that when we stopped everything dead in our tracks and we focused on the exact thing that we needed to be working on in that moment and everyone put all of their forces towards it, we really got it rolled out and it, and it was a pretty big feat to do that. So um, that's a pretty incredible thing and I've tested it myself in my local stores and not only can you get just your regular Wawa needs, but you can get all of the other things that you can get inside your Wawa. You can get your bacon and your cheese and your bread and your Snickers bar and, you know, your gallon of milk, those things as well. So it almost took on this whole other system of kind of an off grocery delivery situation um, per se. So the convenience of that was a little different and really helpful during those time frames. One of the things that we talk about a bit is that there's an opportunity coming out of this to flatten the day part curve. Right. Whereas normally your, your traffic looks like, you know, this, maybe there's a way to make it look a little bit more like this. Are you seeing any of that already where it's not just massive spikes during one hour of the day and then it's, you know, not so busy the rest of the day? Are you seeing anything well, sort of flattening out? Yes. It's kind of weird for us because we would generally have, yes, we would have those spikes definitely yeah. during high rush hour times when people were getting to work or going to work um, or breaking for lunch. However, it was really hard to tell with our day parts what people were buying for when mm. um, because a lot of people would buy two to three meals a day at one time. So we have, you know, consumers that eat two to three meals a day with us consistently all the time. Mm. And so but they purchase them because we have an express case with cold food in them or we have, you know, different things like that. And because we're testing things like dinner and take and eat meals and things like that, they have more opportunities to buy different day parts from us at the same time. So that's just been a different opportunity as well. So I think that, yes, to that point, there has been that opportunity to flatten the day curve, but it's kind of hard to track that, not knowing exactly 
whether or not people, I think what we've been able to track is people are buying more bulk at one time. So their basket might be a lot larger, but we'll only see them yeah, once time. every two days instead of twice a day. Yeah. Quinn, are you seeing any changes in that sort of day part curve at all? So as, as states start to open up, then things uh, are becoming, you know, a little bit more predictable. But, you know, you still, especially as people go back to work and they're coming home, you know, you still see that, you know, five, five to six o'clock yeah. spike as people, you know, stop by to pick things up on their way home. But um, it, for, for us, because we only have the two, the two day parts and things really have still consistently dropped off later in the evening. Um, I have to assume that as things kind of re-equilibrate that that will settle out as well. So we're not, we're not, you know, hitting the panic button yet or, you know, scrambling to kind of reallocate for the day parts. So we're just kind of weathering the storm right now. Hey, on that subject, reallocate, you had a great conversation with us yesterday about just the, you know, the, the, both the real estate, you know, that you have and looking at the future with maybe less diners dining in, um, but also reallocating resources, like you said, for a second drive through, but you also mentioned something about uh, having a second kitchen, you know, so yeah. line in the kitchen, I mean, I should say line in the kitchen, but can you talk to that a little bit? Yeah, that's, so that's, that's really more aspirational, but I think that, you know, as we start getting some reliable long-term data from this whole situation and if the drive-through maintains its momentum and maintains its kind of dominance of our our experience then you know we would certainly almost be forced to figure out how we could figure out a way to kind of and, and, and I mentioned um, Portillo's where you know they they basically have one line but it's two-sided and it's you know one side for the the, the drive-through and one side for the dine-ins but also you know looking at you know some of the things like what chipotle did when they've started to install their their um to go windows and setting up a separate production area for those away from restaurant experiences it, it would be a gargantuan undertaking to retrofit you know even if you had the franchisees putting putting their hand up saying hey yes we need this i want this that that work has i don't even think it's at a proof of concept scale yet so but i think that as we explore what that next generation of restaurant design looks like which we had started working on that's going to be a big a big area of conversation so you know do we take that that dining room, which, you know, right now is kind of optimized to sit 50 or 60 people. And do we shrink that down 30% and shift that real estate to the back of the house for, you know, expanding uh, the production capabilities? I, I, I personally believe that's a direction that we should pursue regardless, simply because of even before all of this, we were just seeing that writing on the wall that, the away from restaurant is becoming the experience of choice for our guests. That's cool. You know, while you're on that and you're talking about like looking in the future, I thought we had a really good conversation about uh, Jack asked the question. So I don't want to repeat your question, but yesterday you asked them, uh, you know, what, what's it look like in the future when you're, uh, you're looking like Rick, you talked about um, the zoom meetings and maybe how potentially you're looking at making changes in your sales meetings. And Farley talked about, you know, virtual uh, innovation as opposed to all these face-to-face -face meetings. Where do you see travel in the future in our industry? What do you think, Rick, you want to start with that? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> yeah. That, you know, the, Getting an entire sales force together nationally, you know, all coming into Reading, PA, uh, albeit it's important, I'm finding that these Zoom meetings are actually a little more efficient. I can have a meeting a week, one hour a day, one hour one uh, a week, and we get to share all the information. And um, it, it seems to be working out very well for us. Now, when I do like new product launches and stuff, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm going to have to bring people in. But I already did a virtual launch uh, using 
Zoom, where we just shipped in, FedExed in the product, and we had R and D go through it one item, one product at a time, explain the attributes, and we would eat with it. So, um, I, I think that there's going to be some changes on how people, you know, get together from from a, a sales perspective. Can I, yeah. Jack, and if I can do a riff on it, I have Farley and Quinn. I mean, to the extent that you're having suppliers work with you virtually or shipping you product, what are the things so far you've seen that you really love? And what are some things like, oh, yeah, there's probably another way to do this aspect of it. What does that virtual sort of innovation thing look like or that virtual collaboration look like? And, uh, and how can it change for the better even? I do really enjoy, um, I'm really enjoying the flexibility uh, of less commuting. So the flexibility of having more virtual is nice, but I do, I'm a relationships person. So having that face-to-face -face time with people is important to me as well. So um, I miss that. The, the travel for me probably will be um, solely based on ICCA to be totally honest, because that's where I get all of my happiness in, in, um, in my relationships. Go ICCA. Um, but truly, honestly, I've been able to have a lot of really good connection through virtual opportunities, um, but I I do miss it. I do miss being able to just have face-to-face -face conversations. I, I don't think it re completely replaces it, um, but in times like this, you can yeah. still get work done. Yeah, and if you're getting, let's say, product shipped to your home, do you have storage space for all the stuff you're being sent? I mean, well, I do, but I yeah. also <laughs> am kind of weird in that that we've got a couple deep freezes, and we, you know, I mean, I'm just, I'm a little, I'm, I'm just kind of weird in that way, but not for everything. <laughs> I've also been able to go into the, I've also been able to go into the kitchen. Um, once a week I've had to sign up for um, for kitchen time for myself and so I've been able to take things back or I haven't had to hold on to it for long and I've been able to have stuff shipped into the kitchen and then I'll be able to evaluate it but I've had people send stuff to my house and and be able to get work done but um, yeah I mean it's okay it's not it's not ideal but I've we've been able to still continue to launch products through this process and maybe a, a version of the question for you is, you know, historically, this industry has relied a lot on conferences and events. And I think coming into COVID, it's like, it's almost like an event every week or every couple of days, it seemed. At what point do you think we get back to that in some regular fashion? Um, I think the kind of the, the, the bleak and stark but honest answer is not until there's a vaccine. Um, and, and that's, that's hard for me to, to think about, but because, you know, similar to Farley, um, hashtag my tribe, um, it's mm -hmm. those, those relationships and those um, opportunities to see this incredible group of people, it, you know, and it's not just about the relationships, but it's just how much it sparks inspiration. Um, and, you know, from the Culver's perspective, we're still pretty much at a, a, a crawl. So our support center is not accepting shipments in yet. Um, I live in a very small townhome, so I do not have the storage space. So, you know, we're having to get a little bit creative. And But today was actually the first day that we had looked at some samples and evaluated samples. Mm -hmm. And, you know, since early March, and this is the third week that we've been when been back in the office. So uh, it's 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 premature for me to say because I think exactly you know what what Rick was talking about where you know you're looking at the product at the same time you know just on different sides of a camera and kind of evaluating them and doing the sensory evaluations that way that that kind of makes sense. Um, otherwise, it's really difficult to imagine, you know, maintaining adequate social distancing even yeah. in our culinary center, which is not small, but it's also not enormous. With so, the mask. Yeah, Sorry. a mask. Mm -hmm. So, yes, yeah, so we're at that time, actually, which it goes by way too fast. Um, 
Yeah, I just want to say thanks to everyone. Jack, thank you very much for always being a part of these. And again, we'll have another one in two weeks. Uh, Jack, I'm sure we'll get some information out to everybody about the competition. and, and oh, yeah. the yeah. You want to talk about that for a second? Yeah, so uh, I forget how many submissions there were, but uh, a few of you submitted ideas using our Food Studio uh, tool to come up with uh, the next great menu item. Those are going to be tested with consumers, and we will announce a winner that could raid. Uh, I don't think we call it Kevin's Closet, but yeah. like that. You could... Storage unit that's way bigger than a closet, and there's yeah. two of them. Yeah, there's some good stuff in those storage units, I bet, though. <laughs> hey, Quinn, I'd be remiss, and my team would never forgive me if I don't tell you that I think I can find some good people to help you with that dessert problem. <laughs> I was waiting for that. <laughs> I mean, I opened the door. you you got to walk through it. <laughs> That's great. awesome. Well, yeah, Quinn and, uh, and Rick and Farley, thank you so much. And thanks to all of our sponsors uh, who make this possible. Hey, I see somebody in the background there. <laughs> oh, we need an introduction. That's wonderful. Hi, this is Avery. This is my 10-year-old, my oldest. Hi, and you had a birthday recently, I think, right? Oh, you too. So. Future movie star. On June 10th. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks again, again, to all the sponsors and to all of our members Thank that are on here. Really appreciate it. Looking forward to getting together. We're still planning on this September. Been in touch with people in Louisville recently on uh, our first event, and then October for Portland, Oregon. Um, so we're looking to be on track. But, you know, of course, it's day to day as we follow what's happening in our country and state by <laughs> state. So uh, thanks again, everyone. Really appreciate it. Hope you have a good rest of your week. Thanks. Bye, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. Good.